I was recently inspired to do a message about marrying for a mantle to show that a person doesn't gain a another person's mantle because of marriage. In an example, a person does not become a prophet or a prophetess by marrying a prophetess or a prophet. Now this message is about spiritual authority and what's called a proxy. You may be a member of a financial institution and every so often you'll get something in the mail or maybe you have investments and it speaks about someone having your proxy and that you can participate in, in board meetings but because you usually don't go then someone has your proxy. The person has the ability, the authority to vote on your behalf to make decisions on your behalf and usually don't pay attention to those decisions. There's a thing when it comes to spiritual warfare there are some spirits that try to play the role of a person's spouse and that's why sometimes people have dreams and in dreams it's like they're in a relationship they may have dreams about kissing someone the intimacy level may go beyond that but it's a spirit playing the role of a person's spouse. And also when a person is undergoing such warfare, there are times you may have dreams and it seems as if someone else is making decisions for you. It may be even to the point where it seems as if your will doesn't matter because someone else is making decisions for you. And that's one of the devices of the enemy. The Apostle Paul told us about not being ignorant of the devil's advices lest he get an advantage of us. But unfortunately, the Bible doesn't have all of the enemy's devices clearly stated. Regarding what are called spirit spouses, whether a quote unquote spirit husband or spirit wife, it's best in events in Genesis 6 when the watchers, the angels, left their heavenly abode, came upon earth and took the daughters of men as wives. So this message, it applies to spiritual entities and also human beings who may try to do the same thing. So I'm going to run through several examples of what it means to use what is called a proxy and also justification for it to try to use someone's mantle. So it's not like a person is able to steal the mantle, but what they do, they in a sense serve as a proxy to use that person's mantle. Sometimes it's a good thing. Other times it is corrupt. It is pure wickedness. If there's any such thing such as pure wickedness. So first example regarding spiritual authority and someone trying to serve as your proxy to make decisions on your behalf. As I said that, have you term a living will? How you um, say certain things like do not resuscitate in defense of these things. But if you don't have a living will, then someone else has to make a decision for you. When to essentially pull the plug. Your life is in a person's hand. The same thing kind of goes for spiritual authority. So also be careful about anyone who tries to use or abuse your gifts and your callings. Be careful about anyone who tries to use your mantle. And there's some ministers, they're guilty of this. They're, they may have someone or people below them that truly have a higher level of spiritual authority than they do. And even regarding certain manners or certain matters, but they'll do certain things deceptively using witchcraft to try to serve as a person's proxy and they're in a sense walking around with another person's mantle because they're serving in a position of authority and they're abusing it. As I'm saying that I'm reminded of Eli. Yes he was a man of authority but then in his house 
he was raising a young prophet named Samuel, a man who the things that he said certainly came to pass because the Lord didn't allow any of his words to fall to the ground. As we see in 1 Samuel 3, verses 19 and 20. Then Joseph and Mary, raising a young Messiah. <laughs> oh, oh. And then there's this more contemporary version. I laugh because um, of what I was just reminded of. But it's a bad thing. In some places, their children with bad credit because a parent or a guardian use a child's social security number to do bad things. See, their credit is shot, so they use the child's social security number. They stand in proxy for the child. So they ruin theirs and then they ruin the child's. That kind of thing is going on even in the church, regarding spiritual authority. So some examples of being a proxy for someone or using someone's spiritual authority in the form of a proxy. In 1 Kings 1 verses 1 through 6, it reads, Now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. Wherefore his servants said unto him, let there be sought for my lord, the king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord, the king, may get heat. So they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coasts of Israel, and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. Now the damsel was very fair, and cherished the king, and ministered to him, but the king knew her not, didn't sleep with her. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him, prepared him chariots and horsemen, and fifty men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time, in saying, What hast thou done? And he also was a very godly man, and his mother bear him after Absalom. By this time, Absalom was dead. Absalom also rose up in opposition to his father. Another story. But here we see, David was old, stricken in years. So his son exalted himself. This is a principle that evil spirits and even evil people are doing. Sometimes they're trying to say, well, they're mentoring a person. And they put restrictions on a person that God did not intend. Rather than teaching a person and giving a person opportunity to grow, and it may be prudent, for example, when it comes to prophetic ministry, that before a person releases a prophecy, that he or she uses someone senior or could even be elders to in a sense bounce the prophecy off to test the spirit. It may help, but if that person is restricted to where he or she cannot re release a prophecy unless he or she runs it by a certain person or a certain group, is that how God uses prophets? In the Bible, I mentioned about um, Samuel being a young man. Jeremiah was a young man when the Lord called him. Into the point when he told the Lord that he was a young man and couldn't speak. But the Lord told him to speak whatever he told him to speak. Do not be confounded by them because I'll confound you before them. So even as a young man, Jeremiah didn't have to go to the priest to release a prophetic word. When the Lord told him to speak, he spoke. And one thing about someone standing in proxy is sometimes they try to put themselves in the position of God. That is an issue. 
Because in a lot of ways, they try to stand in proxy of the person you can say below them, and they try to stand in proxy of the person above them. They try to stand in the place of God. And that can become of the Antichrist. Antichrist, one who stands in place of God and or against God. In place of or against. So David was old, stricken in years. See, that became a reason, for instance, Absalom to take David's proxy or to become a proxy for David. I say, well, he's old. He can't hack it anymore. So I'm going to stand in his place. So in a sense, becoming a spiritual proxy. But then a part of this, it says, and his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, if you find yourself in a position where someone is trying to abuse or use your mantle, your gifts and callings that the Lord God has given to you, you have the authority to rebuke the person. You have the authority, in a sense, to snatch your proxy back. It is yours. You would have to give an account to the Lord God Most High regarding how you used your gifts and your callings. So someone, in a sense, has taken your stuff. And they're people. They've been in a position where they release or they go to someone to say, hey, um, the Lord showed me this in a dream. And that person's like, okay, um, keep quiet until I give you the word to release it. But the word may never come. And then the individual, he or she told, next thing the person starts speaking, oh, I had a dream and the Lord showed me this. But it was a dream the person had. See that kind of spiritual proxy thing? Or the person may say, oh yeah, um, this prophet told me this or someone told me this. But they never give the person credit for what Lord God has revealed to him or her. So it's a spiritual proxy. I'm also reminded of King Saul. King Saul inquired of the Lord. The Lord would answer him via dreams, the Urim, or via prophets. So he went somewhere else to find information because he was in rebellion against the Lord. Some people, they get into this position of becoming a proxy, using someone else's gifts, someone else's calling, someone else's authority. Because maybe they're in a position where the Lord used to use them mightily. But because of their rebellion, the Lord may not even communicate with them anymore. So now they try to put others under them to prop themselves up. They stand as a proxy, misusing someone's gifts, someone's calling, someone's godly authority. Another example of someone as a proxy using someone else's spiritual authority is in 1 Kings 21, and I'll read from verses 1 through 11. So in David's case, in a sense, Adonijah became David's proxy because of David's age. His, his age and his health. I was reminded of um, I won't even mention it. So in 1 Kings 21 verses 1 through 11, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I'll give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or, if it seems good to thee, I'll give thee money, or give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it, 
that I should give the inheritance, oh my gosh, that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. This didn't hit me until now. So Ahab, the king, wanted Naboth's vineyard. But he's like, oh, oh, oh no, even to the king, you can't have it. This is my father's inheritance. That is how you should be when it comes to your gifts and your callings and your spiritual authority. You should not be giving it to anyone. I haven't spoken about it in a while, but the animated version of the movie, The Pilgrim's Progress, when Christian Pilgrim was in the valley and Apollyon or Abaddon came to him, one of the first things he wanted Christian Pilgrim to do was put down his sword of the spirit, the thing that could cut him asunder. Be careful about who tries to get you to surrender to him or her. And again, this also applies to evil spirits because this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to take your, they're, they're trying to be your proxy. They're trying to make decisions on your behalf. And again, this is why some people have dreams and in the dreams, it seems as if nothing they do matters. It's like someone else is pulling the strings. Someone else is making decisions for them. They could say no. Someone else could say yes. I was just mad for a dream that I had. In the dream, I was seated at a table across from someone. Someone I know. And we're eating. And then some people came to the house. And they went off to the right in a room. And it's kind of like, who are these people who just walked into the room? So I went to go confront them. And I was asking who's in charge. And they're talking, ignoring me like I was nobody. It's like, how's it a bunch of strangers coming to this house and now they're being disrespectful? And then I looked and I saw someone sitting down. And in a dream discerned that he was in charge. So I asked him, basically, who gave me authority or the permission? to come into the house. And in the dream, he said, your wife. And that's gonna feel like, I don't have a wife. I guess I'll tell the rest of the dream. This little room was by the kitchen. When I was walking by the kitchen, I saw a woman, or I walked by a woman and my right shoulder brushed against her. I just remember she was dark, short, obese. And I walked fuming and then I heard a person say something and it's kind of like um, like stumbling around and come back to me and I'm like what in the world and I started looking around and I started looking around the first thing I saw was where I touched her there was water on my shoulder and then I looked around Everything got fuzzy to where I couldn't see the person clearly. See, in the dream, the evil spirits was talking about my wife. I didn't have a wife. Gave them permission. How could my quote-unquote wife give them permission? And even if I had a wife, 
why would my quote unquote wife give them permission that I would not be able to rescind? Even in the Bible, it speaks about it speaks about if a woman makes a vow. If her if she's not married and her father hears it and he doesn't break it, then a vow continues. But if he speaks up, then he can break the vow. And the same thing if a woman makes a vow and her husband hears it, if he doesn't object, the vow remains. But if he, if he objects, the vow is discontinued. Seeing the dream, someone was trying to be my wife and to make decisions contrary to my will. And then the evil spirits could say, so-and-so gave me permission. So all this stuff was being done trying to bypass me. That's a form of a spiritual proxy. I wasn't expecting to talk about the dream. But they were wicked people and they were wicked spirits. They try to make it seem as if they're doing what is right. But scripture tells us, the first presenter's case seems right until he is cross-examined. So they're trying to say, oh, we had permission from so-and-so. It's kind of like some people. They're going through deliverance. And devils are refusing to come out. And sometimes it's because there is a devil, quite possibly a fallen angel, that is on the outside as a strong man that is compelling those demons to stay and to resist. So it's about a proxy. The enemy is wicked. Now these things will not stand up in the Lord's court. When God judges, all these things will not work. These are basically shenanigans, spiritual shenanigans. So what the enemy tries to take from you, you say, ah, you're not going to have it. This is my authority, not to be shared. And then for a pseudo wife, that's amazing. I didn't remember the story to share another video about man for a mantle. In fact, this didn't even come, come to mind. But that dream, spirits talk about my wife gave them permission. And because of that, they were treating me as if my opinion didn't matter. Because they had authority from someone else. By the way, this is why some people will want to marry a child of God so that they can serve as a conduit for launching demonic activity. Because sometimes people are like, I don't have any open doors in my life. And the quote unquote open door may not be through you. It may be through someone else. Who no matter speaking has your proxy. And for example, you, know, you may not be a witch, but sometimes a person is even you signing, signing you up as if you're a witch. And it's one of the powerful things about your name being the Lamb's Book of Life. Because if the enemy tries putting you in any of his quote-unquote books, the only book that matter or matters is that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. All that stuff, it's fake. And as the Lord said, touch not mine anointed. So be careful about who you submit to. Be careful about who you allow to do certain things. And woe unto those who try to take what is not theirs. So here it is. Naboth stood up to the king because even though the king, he didn't have authority to just possess a person's land. See, God had laid down the law. 
the king had to ensure that he's complying with God's law. So he resisted. He wouldn't give up his inheritance. In a matter of speaking, he wouldn't give up his gift. He wouldn't give up his calling. He wouldn't give up his anointing to the king. And Ahab came into his house, heavy and displeased, because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And regarding gifts and callings, the Holy Spirit gives gifts as he wills. If a person who is in the kingdom of darkness wants a gift, then truly get saved, become a Christian, and the Holy Spirit will give gifts as he wills. But some people, they don't want God, but they want godly gifts. And they want godly gifts for ungodly purpose. And I say, no, you're not going to prostitute God. You're not going to prostitute his gifts. And that's how some people, some spiritual entities, want to take a person, a child of God, and use him like a spiritual prostitute. And with prostitution, if a prostitute has a pimp, whether a pimp or a madam, the prostitute makes some money and basically hands it over to that person. I remember seeing something, and it spoke about some Muay Thai fighters out of Thailand. It spoke about one of them who was famous. He was famous, yet he was broke. Because every, everything that he earned, those who were in charge of him, and yes, they invested time and effort training him and stuff, but those who brought him up, they took everything from him. So despite making him money, he was broke. They used him. And when I heard that was a norm, I was like, man. Continuing. And he laid down, or he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would not eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, a witch. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, Why is thy spirit so sad? that thou eatest no bread. And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I'll give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I'll not give thee <laughs> my vineyard. So Ahab had a little bit of respect for God had a little bit of respect for the things that the Lord had decreed. So even though he was a bit sullen because of Naboth's decision, he at least respected it. But how about his witch of a wife? Was she going to respect it? And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread. And let thine heart be merry. I'll give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. See, when it comes to witchcraft, they try to use a back door. I mentioned King Saul earlier. When the Lord wouldn't speak with him, communicate to him, communicate with him, what did he do? He went to go see a witch, trying to inquire for a familiar spirit, trying to use a back door. So Jezebel, the witch, now she's going to work her witchcrafts to go use a backdoor method to get from Naboth what Naboth was not willing to surrender. That's also one of the ways the enemy wages war against us, trying to get us to relinquish something we won't surrender. Or if it's something we took back, they try to keep it. One of the things with Adonijah, who propped himself up as king, he was deposed. David made Solomon king. But then he thought, I didn't imagine we finished, but he still tried a backdoor method to pry the kingdom from Solomon, even though he knew the Lord had given it to him. That's how people do. 
you take yourself back from them that belongs to you that they had no business with in the first place and some of them will still try getting it continuing so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal I pause right there she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal what she was doing was use was Ahab was so sullen see he wasn't that wicked to come up with this kind of plan on his own but she did and the thing that he would not do now with her standing as a proxy for him she wrote a letter in his name not in her name and she sealed it with his signet ring not with hers so she's not using her own name she's not using her own authority she's serving as a proxy for Ahab did Ahab know exactly what she was doing probably not the same way who's her standing as your proxy at your financial institution you probably have no idea how they're voting that is the power of a spiritual proxy now she was using her relationship to him as his wife one of his wives at least Ahab had 70 sons so again so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal if she had done it in her name it would not be as substantial it would have been so impactful as writing letters in Ahab's name and by the way well now let me know you say that so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent letters unto the elders and unto the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth Naboth and she wrote in the letters saying proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people so far this seeming holy proclaiming a fast and set two men sons of Belial before him okay now it's getting twisted to bear witness against him saying thou didst blaspheme God and the king Ahab probably had no idea what was going on but his wife standing in as a proxy for him wrote a letter to proclaim a fast set up two sons of the devil to bear false witness and in Deuteronomy 19.15 it speaks about by two or three witnesses every matter shall be established because no one should be put to death based on the testimony of one witness so she's even checking the blocks scripturally she's checking the blocks on the law of Moses it's a little leaven that leavens the lump it's the fly that spoils the ointment be careful little things and the little things will give it away and some people are doing things in the name of others in the, using the authority of others and you have to look out for little things when what the authority they're using is not their own the name they're using is not their own so to be a witness against him saying thou didst blaspheme God and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die and the men of his city even the elders and the nobles who are the inhabitants of in his city did as Jezebel had sent unto them and it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them couple of things Jezebel stood as a proxy for Ahab did the people who received the letter know that Jezebel had written it and Jezebel had used Ahab's signet ring probably not so when it comes to godly things if you as a person with authority were to theoretically write a letter and seal it with your signet ring 
if it came to the Lord, he could look and say, yes, this is so-and-so's handwriting, and this is the authority I gave him or her. And if it wasn't your handwriting, then the Lord would be like, okay, this is the authority I gave him or her, but this is not his or her handwriting, so I'm not going to accept this. Or, if, the, if you're incapacitated in some reason, maybe you had someone else write it, but then you sealed it, then the Lord could be like, okay, understand. But if things are the devil, they don't care about all that. See, they could know that you didn't write it, you had no idea what went on, you didn't even know that your quote-unquote signet ring was missing, or that someone used it. See, all they want is to be able to say, we have a letter in his or her name, and we have his or her signature, his or her signet ring. And they could know that it was forged. But to try to cover themselves, they could say, so-and-so consented. The same way they try to use this story of Joshua, how he was deceived into forming a covenant with the Gibeonites. Or even how Jacob was deceived into marrying Leah. They would try to use those things. But as it is written in Isaiah 28, 18, it speaks about a covenant with death and hell being disannulled, that it shall not stand. So they'll try those things, again, doing illegal things to try to form a legal covenant. When it's fully, or fully interrogated, it'll be obvious. But again, they try to use someone's proxy to do ungodly things, to say that you, a Christian, came to agreement with them. That's why sometimes people have dreams and they wake up from the dreams and can't remember what happened. Because the enemy doesn't want you to remember what happened. So you can at least challenge it. And it doesn't mean you have to challenge every dream. Because there are things the enemy will try and none of that stuff will work. They can't curse who God has blessed. And what they're trying to do sometimes is to come against the word of God. And what are they trying to do? The word of God stands in opposition of them. They can't break the Lord's promise to you. I've said a lot, a lot more than I thought I would. Another example regarding a proxy standing in place of someone. Now, sometimes it's because a person is ignorant. They have no idea what's, what's going on and things are being done behind their back. Sometimes because a person is incapacitated, and it's actually for a good reason. It kind of came to mind earlier where I didn't say anything, but um, kind of like Pope Francis, the current Pope of the Catholic Church. Who was the other person before him? Like Ratzinger or something like that? I forget his name, his his title. Last time I saw, he's still alive. It's like usually people serving a papacy until they pass away. Kind of like Queen Elizabeth. That's an example too. She's getting up there in age. And with the recent opening of the parliament, and by the way, today's... Oops. I started recording this message, and it was May 31st, 2022. But as I looked down a while ago, it's two minutes after midnight. So now it's the 1st of June, 2022. When the British Parliament recently opened, rather than the Queen presiding over it, her son, Prince Charles, stood in her stead. For that day, he was her proxy. He wasn't the King, but he stood in her place. And that was permissible. And here's another example. Now the Bible has him given two names. Kind of like um, Joash was also called Jehoash. King Uzziah was also called King Amaziah. And reading from 2 Chronicles 26, 14 through 23, here's another example of the principle of 
a proxy to use someone's spiritual authority. So in 2 Chronicles 26, verses 14 through 23, And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields and spears and helmets and haberdashers and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. It reminds me of King Saul going out to make a sacrifice when Samuel should have been one to do so. And as arrived the priest went in after him. Hmm. Oh boy. So King Uzziah, he was the one going in to burn incense without something for the priest to do. So he was usurping their authority. He had authority as a king, but then he was usurping the authority of the priest. If you gave someone your, your spiritual proxy and it was for a good reason, hey, but if someone is just trying to take your authority to, <laughs> to put it to what's for kind of use, that's a different kind of story. But also keep in mind, God will judge. And Azariah, the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord, that were valiant men. And they which stood Azariah the king, and said unto him. So another example of which standing someone. So if someone's trying to stand as your proxy and you know that person's up to no good you know a person's trying to use your gifts and callings for ungodly mm. and then there are times you take things to the Lord oh Lord please expose this person please expose this person for the fraud that he or she is the one who's trying to use my stuff as if it is his or her own because sometimes you can be using your stuff, but it's like someone has a carbon copy and is trying to use that carbon copy. Oh boy. So there is which stood the king, saying, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priest, the sons of Aaron's, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord. So they're rebuking the king. How is the king going to take it? Then I was wroth. Also now he's angry. See, but this anger, it was no longer just directed towards a priest. It was directed to the Lord. Because those priests were standing up for righteousness. For the Lord's sake. And his anger, it was no longer just the priest. Even if he wasn't thinking like this, his anger was now at the Lord. It is a dangerous thing when a person is rebuked of the Lord for them to harden their heart against him. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord, from beside the incense altar. Numbers 12, Aaron and Miriam are speaking out against Moses. Well, like, is he the only one the Lord speaks to? Because his wife was a Cushite. At the end of that encounter, the Lord struck Miriam with leprosy and she remained that way 
for seven days. Had to live outside the camp. And continuing, And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and, behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. I pause. See, there's some folks, you're going to put them out of your life. Because, like Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, they're a thief. They come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So you have to put them out. And everything else is yours, you make sure you hold on to that. You put them out whatsoever they came with. And by the way, when a person had leprosy, it was for the priest to declare the person clean or unclean. Well, there was... Because even Jesus, when he healed the ten lepers, he told them to go show themselves to the priest. So that the priest... See, even Jesus, after cleansing them, he still told them to go show themselves to the priest in keeping with the law. Jesus, a man under authority, a man of great authority. Oh boy. Some people, all they want is authority. But great authority comes great responsibility. All they want is the authority to be able to use and misuse stuff for personal gain. So the priest were the perfect ones to let him know he had leprosy and to treat him accordingly. So again, yea. And again, they put him out. So you, when you realize a person is a certain way, trying to use your spiritual authority, your gifts and callings, sometimes you have to put the person out, or sometimes you have to come out from among them and not be unequally yoked together with a child of the devil. Continuing, yea, himself hasted also to go out. Oh, he could feel the pain. Because the Lord had smitten him. He crossed the line trying to do what the priests were consecrated to do. And Uzziah, the king, was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And again, if you're in a position like this, there are some folks you need to cut off. <laughs> but when you cut them off, be prepared for them to try to hold on with everything they've got. In 1 Kings 1, when Adonijah was deposed as being king, it's like he was trying to do everything to reclaim his position, to become king again. But it was not going to happen. Now he, in a sense, made up his mind that he was going to die trying, because he died trying. For some people, you'll cut them off and they'll keep on hanging, trying to hang on to you. As I was speaking, I was reminded of 1 Samuel 15. The second time when Samuel the seer rebuked King Saul to let him know the Lord had chosen a man after his own heart to be king. And he told him about the sin of rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Samuel told him that the Lord had rejected him because he had rejected the word of the Lord. When Samuel was walking away, Saul, Saul, held on to his robe and tore a piece of it. He was holding on that tightly. But Samuel is not going to have any more of it. Saul had gotten cut off, not only by Samuel, but by God. So some went cut off. They'll try to get back on your good graces. They will hold on. You had to cut him loose cut them loose. In a lot of ways, they're not after you. They're after what they perceive that you can do for them because they can't do it for themselves. They don't have a relationship with the Lord. So trying to use your relationship with the Lord. So Uzziah struck with leprosy until the day he died. 
and because he was a leper, he lived separate. And it says, And Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. So Jotham, his son, the king was still alive. Uzziah was still king, but his son had his proxy to judge people. So in this case, Jotham wasn't trying to pull no backdoor stuff. His father was incapacitated. So Jotham, Jotham served as a judge, served in a king's position. Now the rest of the Acts of Uzziah, first and last, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, Amos write. So Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belonged to the kings. For they said, He is a leper. And Jotham his son reigned in his stead. So while he was still alive but a leper, his son was basically had his proxy. And when he died, then his son reigned in his stead. Now some people have taken this too far. Some people have gone to the graves of who they'll call deceased generals of the faith. And they're misusing what is written with 2 Kings 13 where Elisha was buried. He was dead. And it was during the time of great tumult. And some men were going to bury someone. And some raiders came. And they just threw his body into the tomb. His body ended up touching Elisha's bones. And he was raised from the dead. Some people use that as the pretext to go to some famous people's grave and a term is called grave sucking to try to receive the anointing of the person who had passed away and why try to get an anointing that someone else had and who knows what the person went through if the person is truly of the Lord for the Lord to bless that person in such a way do you think all we're going to do is just go to the grave and quote unquote suck up that person's anointing so there's some people it's like they'll even try to use what belongs to you after you pass away if they outlive you so Jotham his father Uzziah Amaziah was struck with leprosy because he was a leper he lived separately but Jotham stood in his place as his proxy to judge and then when King Uzziah died, Jotham officially became king. I pray this message has been a blessing to you regarding not just a proxy, but a spiritual proxy. That's why some people are so, in a matter of speaking, desirable for marriage. And it's like people aren't interested in the individual. They're interested in the anointing. <laughs> and sometimes the people who are interested in the anointing are children of the devil. And what fellowship hath light with darkness? Was well, like a fly that sees the light of a bug zapper and is attracted to it. What's going to destroy them? Does this message resonate with you? Have you ever been down a road where someone tried to be your proxy? Making decisions for you? And by the way, as Christians, in Ephesians 6 speaks about a full arm of God and mentions us being ambassadors of Christ. See, we're supposed to be ambassadors of Christ. When a nation has an ambassador, the ambassador is an emissary for the nation's senior leader. 
but the decisions of the ambassador, even if they're not made in concert with the nation's leader. Because the nation, that person, the ambassador is in, in that country, could be a foreign minister or even the leader of the nation, need to be able to see that ambassador as someone he or she can get quick decisions from. There should be very few things in a matter of speaking that the ambassador would have to reach back to the nation's leader to say, hey, um, this is going on. That will come at some point in time. So the ambassador should be making decisions commensurate with the types of decisions the leader would make in that position. So as an ambassador of Christ, you should be making decisions commensurate with the word, the will, and the ways of God. And a part of making the decision is because of the Holy Spirit in you. A person who is a child of the devil, even if they can put themselves in your position, they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them. They've been led by another spirit. So if someone's going to be your spiritual proxy, that person should be making decisions commensurate with your thought patterns, the way you represent the Lord. Not for something else, not for evil deeds, not to write letters in your name, try to set others up for evil. No. In the Lord's house, there's order, where there's some who come to bring this order. Like their father, the devil, they come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Be careful about who tries to serve as your proxy. And if someone's trying to, if someone, in a sense, has hijacked, has connived, has used some backdoor means, and is being your proxy without your permission, may the Lord expose them in the most embarrassing way. May the Lord expose them in the most embarrassing way that they will never do it again. Because like scripture says, them that sin, rebuke for all so others may fear. God bless you. And Jesus the Christ is Lord. I thought I was finished. But I turned everything off to transfer the file to my computer to start rendering the video. And I do have another message to record after this. And then I'll call it night. And right now it's 12.24. It's after midnight. So I'm going to be burning the midnight oil. But something came up regarding this proxy. And it's about marriages. A couple years ago, Lord had me write a book called The Devil's War Against Your God-Ordained Marriage. And sometimes what the image tries to do is to put another person, whether it's a spirit or a human being, in the life of the person God has ordained for you to marry. It's kind of like how Jacob was working seven long years to marry Rachel. But Laban, the man he made a covenant with, put Leah in her place. And it would seem as if when Jacob ended up marrying Leah, unknowingly, and when he woke up the following morning, and he saw Leah and was mortified, it seems as if all hope was lost for him to marry the woman he had made a covenant to marry. But it happened. In Genesis 31, or in Genesis 30, there's a point when Leah said to Rachel about taking her husband. Leah, the woman who stole Rachel's fiance, her future husband, was accusing 
Rachel of stealing her husband. The thing is, Leah had been unseated. In a lot of ways, she was never unseated because she was in a position that she never belonged in. As I'm saying this, more stuff is coming out. I was just reminded, in 2015, a woman told me of a dream that she had, allegedly. While well, I was in my living room ministering, where I am right now. But I was in my living room ministering, and my wife was in a chair beside me. And there were women who were looking at me, but my wife was not paying attention. And my wife got up, and she left her shofar. And because my wife got up, and I was busy ministering, that the woman sat in my wife's chair. In a sense, keep the woman at bay. He said, Time was thinking. Okay, that's a dream. She sat in my wife's chair, but a shofar was there, which meant my wife would be back. But in hindsight, I should have rebuked her and that dream. Because whether my wife is with me physically or not, her chair is not for anyone to sit in. It doesn't need to be kept warm. And if she's not doing her job, then let the consequences be. But I do not give anyone permission to sit in a place, to be in a position that only belongs to my wife, the one whom God has ordained. Because anyone who tries to sit in a chair will be on fire. When I was inspired to write this book in 2014, this book is dedicated to my wife, the woman the Lord has ordained for me. This is back in 2014. Then, I think it was March of this year, the Lord had me revise the cover, and it's something I wanted to do. This book is still dedicated to the woman the Lord has ordained for me to marry. I'll not marry anyone else, and I'll not allow anyone to stand in a position that only belongs to my wife. And yes, this rep represents someone trying to stand in the place of my wife. But a pseudonym for that individual is not my rib. You never were, you never will be. I never knew you. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. There's a lot to break down there. See, this book is for my wife, no one else. Is the book publicly available? Yes. Others can buy it if they want, but the book is for the woman the Lord has ordained as my wife. I say all of that to say this. There are times when what you have that the Lord has ordained for you, the enemy will put someone in their position, but you have to unseat them. Now you make sure it's the Lord, because some people are trying to unseat someone the Lord has put in a position. And unseating doesn't mean you try to steal, kill, or destroy. The Lord promised the Israelites a land, and there were obstacles in that land, to include giants such as the sons of Anak. But the Israelites had to come to a point where they're like, I'm going to go possess what the Lord God has told me to possess, and I'm going to snatch up every single thing that is trying to be in a position. I don't care what you've built. I have a word of the Lord, and this is mine. So there are times you need to get spiritually aggressive 
and said, Lord, I know that you said that this is mine or so-and-so is mine. And I want what is mine. Everything that's trying to stand in the way of the promises that you have made to me. I ask you to uproot those things. Uproot them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't need anyone occupying my spot. There's no sign saying for rent, vacancy, or open. If anything, let the sign says reserved. And let it be clear to that person that I'm the one it's reserved for. But I don't give anyone permission to be in a position that you have ordained for me. I don't need anyone teaching so-and-so or my future spouse a lesson. Now, Lord may have some stuff happen, but you exert your authority. You let it know, let it be known in the natural realm and the spiritual realm. This is what the Lord has promised for me, and no one else can have it. No one else can occupy my spot. And there are times the Lord will tell you, go possess the promise. And something or someone may be there. And the thing is, they'll remain there until you show up and say, this is mine. And I'm speaking spiritually now. Don't become violent. But it's like you're saying spiritually, this is mine. You can either go in peace or you can leave in pieces. Because enemy is waging war against what is yours. And you have to let it be known. You can't have it. I will not let you have what is mine. I'm not sure if this is going to result in a separate teaching, but this message went in places I never expected to go. But the Lord's will be done. And suddenly, as I'm speaking, I'm getting heated. I feel, <laughs> I feel the heat. Because even as I was saying that, what the Lord God has for me, I don't give anyone or anything permission to occupy a position that only belongs to me. I exert the authority the Lord God has given to me. Anyone trying to use or take my proxy, I rescind that in the name of Jesus Christ effective immediately. Anyone trying to take what belongs to me, be removed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone trying to stand in a position that belongs to me, be gone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And anyone trying to stand in a place that only belongs to those the Lord has ordained, likewise, likewise, depart from me you work of iniquity. Don't let anyone take what's yours. Don't let him use it. Take what belongs to you. And maybe, maybe it's not time for you to possess the promise in the natural realm. But spiritually, you lay your claim. This is mine. I'll be back to get what's mine. Either keep away or when I show up, either you leave in peace or leave in pieces. I'm not sharing what God has for me. Go get your own. <laughs>